Greetings teachers from around the world. Welcome to this, the fourth webinar in series five. This webinar series is brought to you by the American English team at the U.S. Department of State in Washington, D.C. And I'd like to start our session today with this great photo submitted by Gabrielo, Gabriela Castillo, who was a viewing host at Benemerita Universidad Autónoma in Puebla, Mexico, where EFL teachers have uh, been gathering uh, from different parts of the university to view the American English webinar since 2014. So thank you for sending in that photo. We do love to see teachers learning together. Please do keep sharing your webinar viewing group photos by emailing them to AmericanEnglishWebinars at elprograms.org. We might just feature them in the next webinar. I'm Heather Benucci, part of the American English team, also known as Moderator Heather. And today you're going to see moderator Lauren in the chat box, and we will both be here to assist and support you as you participate. Here is the exciting remaining part of the schedule for this series. Our next webinar, Learner Training, Increasing Engagement by Developing Student Autonomy by Maggie Steingraber, will be in two weeks on March 15th. And speaking of our next webinar, it is important for everyone to please note that daylight savings time will begin in the United States on March 12th. On that day, we switch to daylight savings time, and that means we set our clocks ahead one hour. Webinar 5.5, which is our next webinar, is going to take place at the normal times, 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern time in the United States. However, you might find that the webinar is broadcast one hour later in your local time. Please, please use the time conversion link provided here to confirm your local webinar start time and be sure to enter the webinar date March 15th when you're using the converter. This time change will also apply to the last webinar in Series 5 on March 29th. Information about the time change is on the Ning in the announcements section and you'll also receive information in an email reminder um, that you will receive prior to the next webinar. We don't want you to miss our last two webinars in Series 5, so be sure to check your local start time. Our webinars are each 60 minutes long, and they are usually related to a theme found on the American English website. The Teacher's Corner section from this website, which is shown here, features resources and lesson ideas related to the month's topic. Our theme for March is Increasing Learner Engagement. Next, let's take a look at how you're going to participate in the webinars. Most of you are familiar with these processes by this point in the series, but to review, you're going to hear but not see our presenter today, and the way you're going to participate is by typing in the chat box, as most of you are doing now, and that chat box is where you can ask questions or make comments related to today's topic. We may not be able to answer every single question during the session since there are often hundreds of teachers around the world participating. However, you can ask questions after the session is over on the Ning Community for Teachers, which we'll look at in more detail momentarily. The presenter may also ask you questions in the form of multiple choice and multiple answer polls, which will appear on the screen for you to answer. And unfortunately, some of you might experience technical problems during the webinar. We'll let you know if we do have a global technical issue. However, if you do lose sound, do try to follow along with a caption pod at the bottom of the screen if refreshing your internet browser doesn't correct the problem. Each webinar series consists of six webinars, and those webinars take place every other Wednesday. Those of you who attend at least four of those six webinars will receive an e-certificate from your regional English language office or local U.S. Embassy after the series ends. And to make sure you're eligible for that certificate, we will ask you to submit your attendance at the very end of the webinar. And we will give you instructions and a link um, that will help you complete this required attendance information. And we hope most of you are already active members in our Ning community, but if you have not yet registered, please do join us. It might take up to 72 hours for your registration to be approved. Here on the Ning, you can find resources and discussion questions related to, to each webinar, as well as all of the webinar recordings and featured materials. 
This community is also where you can ask presenter, the presenter questions after the webinar and you can live chat with your fellow community members. And finally, before we begin, a quick reminder that our next facilitated Massive Open Online Courses, or MOOCs, will begin on April 3rd. These free MOOCs are for those who are interested in learning more about using English to grow and develop in their careers or to explore different types of media. Registration for these MOOCs begins on March 20th and both courses start on April 3rd. More information, including how to register, is available via the link shown here and um, being displayed in the chat box. And now on to today's webinar, Using Visual Literacy Skills to Encourage Communicative Language Practice. Today we will examine how visual literacy can be used as a tool to enhance communicative language practice, critical thinking skills, and vocabulary development. Our presenter will share specific examples of how to incorporate images into the classroom, as well as language exercises focused on relevant visuals and how to adapt these exercises to different language levels. And I am excited to introduce our presenter today, our very own moderator, Katie, Katie Subra. Katie earned her Master of Arts degree in teaching English as a second language from the University of Minnesota. And she's currently the online projects manager for the EL programs team at Georgetown University. She served as an English language fellow in Minsk, Belarus from 2013 to 2014. From 2010 to 2016, Katie taught academic skills and led cultural field trips for college students and an intensive English program in Minnesota. She also led teacher training workshops for international teachers visiting the US and for educators in China as a visiting lecturer in 2015. Katie has volunteered as an adult basic education instructor in various areas of the US, as well as a classroom assistant in Cusco, Peru. Welcome, Katie. Thank you for that great introduction, Heather. I'm very excited to be here today as a presenter, and I'm excited to share one of my favorite tools for classroom engagement with you, visuals. Today, I have some objectives for things that I hope to accomplish and things that I hope you will accomplish or get out of this webinar. So my goals for myself are to discuss the benefits of using visuals in English language classrooms and to explain activities that incorporate two specific types of visuals, signs and infographics. My goal for you is that you will hopefully discover activities and resources adaptable for your classroom setting. Earlier in the poll, many of you responded about what types of visuals you use in your classroom. And currently, it seems like most of you are familiar with using photographs. And at least some of you responded that you use some of these other things. Um, posters and illustrations were also quite popular, um, with art and signs or advertisements being the least popular. Well, I'm happy to hear this because today I will touch briefly on the use of photographs and art, but I'm mainly going to focus on the use of signs and graphics, such as charts or diagrams. Um, before, before I give you some more examples of visuals that I like to use, I wonder if you could type in the chat box some other types of visuals that you have used in your classrooms. So other than what is listed here, what have you used before? Okay, I see videos and maps, magazines, that's great. In the Ning as well, many of you have told me that you use a whole variety of visuals in your classrooms. I'm happy to hear that. Okay, flashcards and illustrations, those are all great examples. So here are some other kinds of visuals that I have used. Things like maps as well and comics or flags, uh, posters and brochures. It seems like there's always a new visual out there that you can find and adapt for your classroom. 
Uh, also in the beginning of the webinar, some of you answered the second question in the poll. Do you encourage your students to bring or create their own visuals? And I was happy to see that about 90% of you said, yes, you do encourage students to bring their own visuals. Um, I think that's very encouraging um, in terms of student engagement. And I'm sure that some of your students also enjoy doing that. I wonder if you could raise your hand if your students are also happy to bring their own visuals to class. You can raise your hand by clicking on the little person at the top of the screen. Great. A lot of you are, a lot of hands are going up. That's awesome. Um, you can put your hands back down by clicking on the person again. And I'm happy to see that because, once again, I think that having students be involved in choosing and bringing visuals is a great way to increase engagement. So, as I said before, visuals are one of my favorite tools for the classroom, and you can probably guess why at this point. But before I talk more about the benefits of using visuals, I'd like to talk a little bit about another term, literacy and how this fits in with talking about visuals. So literacy is quite a popular term these days, and it can be defined in many ways. For our purposes, though, we'll stick to the definition that literacy is one's knowledge or ability as it relates to one specific topic. For example, the term digital literacy can be used to describe one's knowledge of and ability to use digital tools, such as software, computers, or other electronics. In fact, you are demonstrating your digital literacy skills right now by participating in this webinar. Uh, I could say that you are all very digitally literate. In addition to digital and visual literacy, I have some other terms listed here. You might hear about cultural or nutritional literacy, mathematical literacy as well. There are many other types out there. Often we rely on multiple types of literacies at the same time, and you may require your students to do so as well, while they are learning English in a content-based curriculum. For example, your English class may learn about the history of another country while practicing their English skills. You can even integrate multiple English skills at the same time, such as reading, writing, listening, speaking, vocab, and grammar. So in fact, you're using multiple literacies in an integrated skills English classroom. Okay, that's a lot of terminology, but let's get to our topic for today, visual literacy. So I'd like to share a quick definition for what I see as visual literacy. Uh, when I think about visual literacy, I also like to think about reading. So my definition for this is the ability to read and understand a variety of visuals in a given environment. For example, when you see this visual on the screen, you are very likely to be able to read it and understand what it means given your knowledge of the symbol and the environment you find it in. We'll come back to this example again a little bit later. Uh, now I'd like to differentiate a little between some simple visual literacy skills and higher visual literacy skills. So simple visual literacy skills are used from an early age and are generally understood by a large number of people. For example, I may use my visual literacy skills to read a sign such as these signs on the left side of the screen, which can be found in a train or in another public area. When I look at the sign, I read it and understand what I'm expected to do. Um, the signs on the right are taken of two different um, animal sanctuary signs, and these are places where animals are protected. These were taken in two different places within the U.S. and they warn visitors that the animals that are contained behind them can be dangerous to humans. So sometimes signage has just a picture and sometimes it has language, but these are generally pretty easy to understand. 
This image, however, demonstrates higher visual literacy skills. Uh, this is a popular image of a painting by Lily Ferretti, who is, uh, the painting is on display in the Smithsonian Museum of American Art. The title of the piece is, very fittingly, Subway. And reading this image requires a higher level of visual literacy skills than what I had shown you on the previous slide. I'm wondering if you can answer the, the question, why? So in the chat box, Tell me, why do you think that art, such as this painting, would require a higher level of visual literacy skills? Okay, I see some people saying that um, they like using art, and um, this particular art could be a symbolism, or vocabulary could be more difficult when reading this. Okay, you need... Um, Complex vocabulary and more descriptions. Great. A lot of it is about culture, too. So there are more details and there's cultural knowledge that you might need to understand it. Very good. Okay. Very good. So you can see why something like this might require higher level visual literacy skills. Um, in fact, bringing art into the language classroom is a great way to encourage the use of visual literacy skills alongside integrated language skills. After this webinar, I'll share some additional resources for using art in this way, but today I want to focus on other types of visuals, and we'll discuss those after we talk a little more about some of the benefits of using visual literacy in the classroom. Uh, let's go to a quick poll. I wonder, from your point of view, which of these do you see as the benefits of using visual literacy skills in the language classroom? Are the benefits that you utilize authentic materials, you use multiple integrated skills, teach content-based vocabulary, perhaps? You can answer more than one, so please check all things that you think are the benefits for using visual literacy skills in the language classroom. Right. So some of you are checking all of the boxes, and most of you agree that it uses um, authentic materials, so that's good to know, and integrated skills. Okay, very good. Thank you for your responses. As a matter of fact, I think that all of those benefits that were listed in the poll are good benefits of using visual literacy skills in the classroom. So first of all, reading and understanding visuals helps learners utilize authentic and culturally relevant materials. These materials may include visuals from the educational setting, from news sources, or from the community, for example. Also, the ability to read and understand a visual may require students to use multiple skills at the same time. So for example, students may speak about visuals or write about them. They may read texts that are included with a visual or even embedded in the visual. And they may listen to each other talking about them. Now, depending on the visual type, students uh, may need to learn new content-based vocabulary. For example, looking at an advertisement could require students to learn advertising-specific language, such as um, knowing about audience. Uh, likewise, if your students are already studying a specific topic, such as health or business, they can repeat the vocabulary that they are learning by looking at content-related visuals. Many language learners learn better when they have visuals. I am one such learner. I am a visual learner. Um, unfortunately, this has led me to draw many poorly thought out pictures or charts on my chalkboard in the classroom, but with a little forethought, I can bring visuals to my class that I've accessed online, or I can ask students to find them in their homes or online or in the community. Usually that goes over a little better than my drawn visuals. Depending on the type of visual and the activity that you design around it, students are likely to use critical thinking skills to understand visuals. 
because they are likely to have a, an emotional response to those visuals. So they see a visual, they have an emotional response, and that makes them use their critical thinking skills to talk about that visual. Lastly, in order to share their unique interpretation of a visual, students will need to share their ideas communicatively. All of these benefits can contribute to higher learner engagement with your lesson plans. So, um, visual literacy skills can be utilized for any age of learner at any level. Visuals can be simple, as you can see by the image on the left, and they can be complex. You can ask your students to look at the visuals you provide and create language tasks around those, or you can ask students to create their own visuals to support their demonstration of knowledge about a particular topic. If appropriately selected, visuals can enhance any discussion or assignment. Also, visuals can be included at the beginning of a lesson to introduce a new topic, or they can be used in student summaries of a topic that they have learned. They will very likely be more memorable if your students are allowed to select their or create their own visual. In the United States, Teachers often allow their students to take turns bringing in their own show and tell items to the classroom. A show, and a show and tell item could be a photo, a souvenir, a favorite keepsake, or an artifact. An artifact is something that is created by a human for a specific purpose. Um, the artifact is usually embedded within a culture, and so it might represent that culture or it might have some historical significance. Here I have a photo of a summer vacation I once took, and the images of the north side of the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Photos such as these easily lend themselves to language activities, and for a show and tell activity, personal photos may be particularly useful. So I have some steps that can be used along with this kind of photo in a show and tell activity, but I'd like us to give this a try together. So here's that photo again. And it's, let's pretend that I am the student in this case, and you are also students in my classroom. The teacher has asked me, as a student, to describe my photo while using the past tense. Since you are my audience, you will listen to my description and you will also think of some questions to ask me while also using the past tense. So here's what I might say to you. I took this photo when I visited the Grand Canyon with my friend in 2008. It took us more than 24 hours to get to the Grand Canyon because we drove from another state very far away. But it was definitely worth it to go. Because of the time of day that we got there, we saw the sunset, but we did not see a lot of tourists. Okay, classmates, now it's your turn. Ask in the chat box some questions using the past tense about my photo. Right. Some of you are saying, um, was it very hot there? And I can say that yes, it was very hot, especially because it was July when I went there. Um, and who was with you in this trip? It was just my friend and I, so we took turns driving there. Um, did you enjoy it? Yes, very much. I would love to go back there, in fact, um, but that was my first trip to the Grand Canyon. Um, Let's see, Mike is asking me, did you see a cobra? Um, no, I did not see a cobra, thankfully. However, I did see some cattle on the road while we were driving away. And that was also very surprising. All right, thank you for your questions. Um, I'm sure you can think of many other useful activities to do with photos, but I'm only mentioning them here briefly because you will hear many more great ideas for using photography during webinar 5.6. All right. 
Uh, as I said before, artifacts can also provide unique motivation for practicing descriptive language. An artifact can be selected from another culture, or your students could select an artifact from their own possessions that uniquely represents who they are, what their interests are, or what their life has been like. After studying historical artifacts from a museum um, to learn about the local culture, I have asked my own students to select an item from their homes that represents an important part of their lives or culture for a future generation to look at. They then either took photos of those objects or brought the objects into class and wrote a descriptive paragraph about that object from the perspective of a person outside of their own culture. So they had to kind of think ahead a little bit what someone else might think about them when they find this artifact. Some of the examples of artifacts that they chose were a pillow, a smartphone, a uniform, and a diary. So here is a shortened version of the worksheet that I gave my students to help them to describe an artifact. I asked them, first of all, to write some short notes answering three questions. Why does this artifact represent you? Describe this artifact, um, visually giving some cues about color, size, shape, and so on. And what uses could this artifact have for someone in the future? So thinking about someone 50 or 100 years from now, what would they use this artifact to do? After they've written some notes, they then would be asked to rewrite each answer in two to three full sentences with a little bit more detail. To make it a little more challenging, I've also asked my students to use the third person. So they should not be writing using I, me, and we, but rather he, she, it, or they from the perspective of a future person. Um, now, if, you were to, if I were to ask you what artifact you would choose from your life to represent you, what would that be? If you could write in the chat box something that you would choose as an artifact to represent you. OK, a laptop. Yes, I agree. Laptops say a lot about us. OK, clothes, definitely. Also, photographs. OK, a pen, a radio. A cell phone. I see cell phone a lot going in the chat box. That's very popular. Um, soccer cleats from Edison in Quito. That's a great idea. OK, clothes and photos, mobiles, very popular things. OK, a file. Interesting. All right, so it seems like you all have some good ideas for what you would choose as an example. And keep in mind, it's important that you provide your own example when you ask students to do this kind of activity. So you could bring those artifacts to the class and then ask your students to pick something of their own. OK, poems book. I love that. That's beautiful. OK, so a show and tell activity um, is one of the simplest ways to incorporate visuals in the language classroom. But the basic steps of the activity can be applied to even more complex visuals. Whenever students are made responsible for finding or creating their own, um, to include with a writing or speech assignment, they are showing and telling. Similarly, when you, the teacher, introduce a new topic or lesson while using a visual, you are also showing and telling. I'll come back to this idea later. For now, I'd like to demonstrate how two types of visuals, which are less commonly used in the language classroom, can be used to contribute to learner engagement. OK, so here are some examples of signs on the left and infographics on the right. The, the two signs on the left may be familiar to you. They might be seen in um, public areas or parks. Uh, transportation centers, and so on. And the graphics on the right, they are, one is a little more complex. The first one has some charts and tables within it. And the second one on the far right is more of a simple bar chart or bar graph. 
So infographics can range in complexity, as you see here. I'll give you some more examples as well. So a sample lesson plan that I've come up with um, involves using signs and infographics to talk about the environment. The steps that I would go through very briefly here are, are listed on the screen. Um, as I said before, visuals can come at the beginning, the middle, and the end of a lesson. So I have visuals included in steps one and three here. Um, the very first step would be that I introduce the new topic with a visual, such as the one you see on this slide here. We might, we might look at the visual together and start coming up with some ideas about it and answer some simple questions about it. The next thing I would do with my students is pre-teach or have them brainstorm some vocabulary we would need to talk about this topic. Next, I would encourage my students to go out and find or produce more visuals on this topic. And to challenge my students and help them to understand the topic a little better, I might ask them to create um, more complex visuals or infographics, such as charts, diagrams, maps, tables, or timelines. So let's, let's show this in a few more careful steps. Here we are back to step number one. There is a simple visual on the left, and I would ask my students, where could you find this type of sign? Or alternatively, where don't you find it? They might have some different ideas about this, and that could contribute to more conversation. The next step would be to brainstorm some vocabulary. Now, depending on what supplemental materials I might include, like videos or reading assignments, I would expand or shorten this list. But these are just a few of the things that might come up in a lesson about the environment. For example, environmentally friendly or ecology, which is the study of the earth. Those are all some things that we would want to know before we really delve in or talk more deeply about these issues. Okay, step number three, um, after students bring their own visuals to the classroom, I would want to have a little more of an in-depth conversation about those visuals. For example, uh, if they were to find a sign about environmentalism or something like related to that, we would read the sign together and tell each other what it says. Whether there's language there or not, we can describe what it says. We might also talk about where the sign is found or other locations where we might expect to find it. And we would describe who is the intended audience as well as is it effective. So who is meant to see it and will they understand it when they see it. Let's go ahead and try this step with uh, something similar to a sign, and that is a label. So sometimes signs and labels have actual language on them, such as in this image here, and sometimes they don't. Uh, either way, we can still read them. So looking at this label from a product, household product, I wonder if you could answer, first of all, what does this label say? Okay, so it looks like it demonstrates a forest. Um, it says that it is safe. It's important you noted the color, blue, yep. Okay, someone cares for the environment. All right, very good. Um, so where would you find this label? Maybe in a restaurant, in the woods, okay. It looks like it could also be a sign, so you might see it outside as well as on a product or something that a label would be found on. So where else would you find this label or sign? It might be in a park. It might be on paper or other products. Okay, very good. This is the point where I would ask students to talk about where they specifically found it with question number two, and then the rest of the class could help think of other places where it might be found. 
Um, okay, so just a couple more questions about this label. So the fourth question I might ask my students is, who is the intended audience for this label? Who is meant to see it? Okay, the public, everyone, customers. Very good. Maybe a specific type of customer. And then knowing who the intended audience is, we can talk about whether or not it's effective. So if you think this is effective, you can go ahead and click yes. If not, you can click no. But then, of course, with a yes, no question, I would want to delve further and ask why. Right? So why is it effective? Many of you are saying that it is clear, it's acceptable, it's recognizable. The picture and the words together perhaps make it easy to understand. Okay. Someone is saying, um, Maita from Ecuador says, no, it's not effective because it is not green. It's a good point. You might expect something like this to be a different color. So that could make it difficult. Very good. Um, let's return to the presentation. All right, so I'm including a lot of photos in my slides today. So I wanted to briefly mention that there are many great resources online where you can find signs or labels. Um, these three are listed on the Ning or will be listed on the Ning later today. So it's important to remember to use open educational resources whenever you can. Or of course, you can find your own images and take pictures or bring them to class. So another great resource is to take the photos yourself or ask your students to do so. Uh, if you ask students to go out and take photos in public spaces or retail spaces, please remind them to pay attention to other signs telling them not to take photographs. Uh, it's important that, that they obey as well as read the signs that they're looking at. All right. Um, what other activities could you do with your students when looking at signs or labels? Could you type in the chat box what other kinds of things you might ask your students to do with signs or labels? So far, we've just talked about bringing the visuals to class and then asking and answering questions. But what might you do in, um, in addition to that? Oh, someone is saying fill in a comic strip. OK, write instructions. Very good. You could use a lot of grammar with signs, definitely. Make up your own sign. I love it. OK, find out more about the label. So maybe do a little bit of research. Um, OK, ask them to make cautionary statements. That's a very good idea. Since many of the signs your students will see are prohibitive, um, such as this image showing someone littering, or throwing trash, and it tells you not to do that. So it's a great way to practice imperative statements, for example. OK, another great idea from Erica in Mexico asks them, um, ask them where and why they would put those signs. Perfect. I love this idea. So I'm going to go ahead and share another idea related to yours, which is having students create signs. So perhaps your students can look around their environment, look around their school or neighborhood, and find a place that needs more warning signs or more directional signs. Then they can create the sign using a combination of English and visuals. Uh, they might cut out pictures or they might draw them. But this is an example of just a very simple hand-drawn sign that a student might post somewhere to warn people about um, a crack in the pavement, for example. All right. Um, next, I'd like to share some ideas for using some more complex visuals, infographics. I really like the definition that Voice of America gives for infographics. And I took this from the article that was in the pre-reading resource on the Ning. They refer to infographics as a visual image, such as a chart or diagram, used to represent information or data. 
And this is a very simple example of that here. Um, I also think it's important to note how much infographics help us to read. So this quote from Bit Rebels states that our brain can digest the facts presented on an infographic three times faster than reading it in a text since it's in an illustrated format. I think that having infographics on their own or in addition to texts makes it very easy for students to understand information. Um, and once again, they can range from very simple charts to complex images. So we'll look at some of those examples next. All right. So here I have an example of a relatively simple infographic. This is a histogram. And what it is explaining or showing is um, labeled here at the top. So after a steep rise, recycling and composting rates flatten out. This histogram uh, charts recycling and composting rates from 1960 to 2013. Um, by the way, recycling is the reusing um, of materials and composting is separating the natural trash, such as food items, from other trash so that it can naturally break down. In this histogram, I wonder if you can tell me in the chat box what happened between the years 1990 and 2000. Based on what you see, what happened between 1990 and 2000? Okay, Maya from Belarus says rise. That's very much what I was looking for. Yep, it's going up, um, increase, yep. So the amount of things being recycled and composted have increased during those years. Very good. Okay, my next question then is what happened between 2000 and 2010? So from 1990 to the mid-90s, maybe it was rising quite quickly. And there's still an increase, but... Um, Maria Isabella says that the increase was a little. So from 2000 to 2010, it only rose a little bit. Um, as the title says, it flattened out. Very good. So here is another example of a simple infographic. Now this is about the same topic, and both of these were found in the Pew Research Center website, which uh, is a great resource for academic articles that include infographics as well. So this pie chart shows what gets recycled and composted, and this is based on the year 2013. When you look at this, um, maybe you can tell me next, what is the least commonly recycled or composted material? So out of these things listed here, what is recycled or composted the least? Okay, newspaper, very good. It's easy to see that quickly with the color and the number that is listed there. All right. So these are just a couple of examples of infographics. As many of you mentioned in the Ning discussion, there are many other kinds of graphics, such as bar graphs, Venn diagrams, and other types of charts that you might use in your classes. Since we've looked at a couple of simpler examples of infographics, I'd like to next talk about some advanced infographics. Uh, now this example shows information about the benefits of plants. It includes images and text, and it's just one type of infographic, but you can see already that it's a little more complex than the previous infographics we looked at. Here are three more examples. So the first one has charts and graphs included inside it, so it's a bit more complex. And the one in the middle, for example, has just pictures and some data, so it's a little easier to understand. Now all of these um, are just examples. You can have infographics be other shapes, have other kinds of designs or pictures on them. These three are temp based on templates I found on canva.com, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. So 
in your locations, in your communities and schools, I wonder where have you seen infographics? We're going to go to this poll. Okay, so you see um, some some locations where you might see infographics are in your school, at a community center, on TV or in advertisements, in academic articles or textbooks. Okay. Many of you are saying you see them in your school or library. That's very true. Often we can see them on posters or in textbooks. Great. Okay. A lot of public places might have infographics so that they can share information with the audience very quickly. So I'm, I'm happy to see that many of you are familiar with infographics that you see in your community. Hopefully your students are as well. So let's head back to the presentation. As you noted, infographics are often used in educational and public settings. So you might also ask your students to think about where they see infographics. And you can have a conversation about that and search for some so that they can also bring their examples to class. Here are three more examples, just in case you're not able to see a lot of them easily in your school or in your community. And I'll share these with you later on the Ning. These are three great sites where you can find infographics uh, beyond looking for them, however, you can also engage your students by asking them to create infographics. So just as we discussed student-created signs, we're next going to talk about ways that students can create infographics. So some of the ways to create infographics might be, first of all, to have your students create um, a poster or or some kind of sign on their own um, using paper, using magazines or markers. They can draw an infographic. You can also use some free resources online to create digital infographics. And I took these three examples from that Voice of America article that was on the Ning. There are many others listed there, but I would like to show you how I used the first one, canva.com, to create a student-created um, infographic. Now, when you go to canva.com, the layout might be a little tricky, so it's important to show them examples. And uh, as I'm asking you to do, I have also done. So I created an example of an infographic and I would be able to more easily walk my students through the steps to do so um, after having done it myself. So at canva.com, you can create your own account for free. And you can find a lot of different visual layouts there, things for social media or documents. You can find things like invitations or posters with many different layouts to choose from. I chose the infographics, which is on the bottom right of the screen here. And after I selected it, I had another option of selecting from their variety of layouts or templates. So as you can see on the left, there's just four here, but there are many more on the website. And after I chose one template, I then updated that with my own text and my own images. So that's what you can see on the right side here. And you might recognize this template from before. Um, some of the visuals within the template are pictures that I took. Some of them are things that I found on sites like Let's CC or Pixabake because I wanted to use open educational resources. So let me walk you through the steps of creating such an infographic. So here are the steps. First of all, students would be asked to choose a specific topic related to the theme, or perhaps the teacher might assign the topic to the students. So six ways I can help the environment every day is a topic that either a student might have chosen related to environment, or the teacher 
might tell all students to use this title and create their own version of it. Um, next, students should write their role using imperative statements and I can statements. So this is just a, a grammatical feature that I wanted to practice with my students. So for example, I have a, an imperative statement in the first box that says conserve water. And I have this paired with an I can statement. I can turn off the faucet while brushing my teeth and take faster showers. You could supplement this with your own um, grammatical feature or language that you want students to use. And finally, students can choose images to represent the statements by choosing their own pictures or finding resources online or drawing a picture. So for my infographic, as I said, I used a combination of, of pictures and things that I found online. I'm wondering next if you could tell me in the chat box what topics you're discussing in your classrooms that could be represented with an infographic. So perhaps you are talking about the environment in your class, but also I see people are talking about population or technology. That's great. Going green. Okay, so it's related to the environment, but even more specific. I like that. Okay, art and travel, hobbies or animals. These are all great ideas. Now, I did see someone mention um, a question about the time it might take to do this. That depends a little bit on your student's ability to access these resources. Um, so if they do it with a paper source or online, it could take a little longer online to set up the accounts and to become familiar with the site. So you always want to build a little extra time into your lesson for that. All right. so. Hobbies, social media, and math data. I like all of those examples. I hope you find something in your class that you can use infographics with. So I want to give you a few more pointers, and then we'll come back to a show and tell activity in just a moment. Um, the first thing you want to do is build your collection gradually. So you might have a location in your classroom where you can collect some visuals, such as pictures or realia, in a folder or in a bin. And you could put a lot of visuals there at the beginning of the class or the theme. And you could ask your students to contribute to that as well. This way, you always have something available that students can look at or incorporate in their reports or presentations. As long as you have a little bit of space, I think that having too many visuals won't be a problem because maybe it's true that your students can't access those visuals as easily on their own, um, or maybe they would like to use a lot of different examples. So having a place in the classroom where they can find those things can be very useful. And um, you can incorporate show and tell activities with simple visuals at the beginning and more complex visuals later on. So having a collection allows you to keep bringing the visuals back throughout the class time. So let's go back to a show and tell activity here. Um, now on the left side of the screen I have another picture and on the right I have my infographic. I might use the picture as a show and tell activity at the beginning of a lesson on the environment. This particular picture is of the Mississippi River seen from the shore of my home state, which is Minnesota. And I might show this image to my students to tell them here is a place where I want to protect the environment. This is environmentally important to me. And that's a very simple activity to do at the beginning of class. Maybe other students would come up with other examples of natural sites that they want to protect. And as we learn more about the environment and talk about how to protect it and things we can do, we can work up to creating something more complex 
such as this infographic. So you can keep bringing these visuals back. You could even incorporate this picture into the infographic if you like. And it just helps students build the levels up slowly while using many different skills. All right, I have a few last tips I'd like to share with you. So it's important to do what comes naturally. Variety and relevance are important. And sometimes one of those can make us forget about the other. So when you're trying to get a lot of variety and things collected in your classroom, you also want to keep in mind what subjects and interests your students have. And that way you can select the visuals that are important to them. Um, the other thing I want you to remember is that your students are already visually literate in their native language. So allowing them to apply these skills in English as well really helps them to engage more with the language in a, in a natural way. Let's go quickly to a poll. I'm curious at this point what activities and visuals you will use in your classroom after what we have discussed today. So if you could tell me, please, um, what types of activities from today's webinar will you use in your classroom? I have listed here show and tell activities with a teacher found visual or student found visual. You could do some discussion of labels, signs, or infographics, or you can have some student-created activities. So I see that most of you are saying that you will definitely do a show and tell with your own visuals, but you also have some of your students do that too. Okay, and labels and signs, infographics, all of these are getting some response, so I'm happy to see that. Again, my goal is for you to be able to use at least one of these activities in your classroom. So I'm happy to see that. And if you don't already know, um, or if your students don't already know the phrase show and tell, that's a great way to start. All right, so let's go to some final reflections. These are questions that I'd like you to keep in mind as you're planning the use of visuals in your classroom. So these are things that you might want to just think about a little more and perhaps we'll discuss them further on the Ning later on. Um, first of all, what new vocabulary will you want to teach for discussing visuals? What vocabulary do you need to talk about the theme in the visual, but also what vocabulary do they need to, to even know what the visual is? So for example, a histogram or infographic those might be new vocabulary items for your students. So you want to pre-teach those. Also be thinking about where your students can find visuals and where you will find visuals as well. Lastly, keep in mind at what stage in le the lesson you plan to introduce visuals. Hopefully you found ways to introduce them at all levels of the lesson or all stages and if you don't, um, at least trying to introduce visuals in one or two new stages of your lesson plans will be a very useful thing for your students. So I've appreciated your participation today. It seems like you already have a lot of great ideas and hopefully you found a couple of new things here. This list of references and resources will also be on the name later. So if you'd like to learn more about using visuals, you can head over there to continue the discussion. So thanks. So Thank you so much, Katie, for sharing those ideas for developing students' visual literacy skills. I think you provided great resources and some practical strategies that we can all use to encourage communicative language practice in our classrooms. We're looking forward to your post-webinar discussion and also to checking out those great resources you just mentioned that will be on your Ning page. I also want to say a big thank you to our participants out there around the world for your 